How to maintain your ideal state. This particular Dr. Joseph Murphy inspired discussion, based on quotes from various books, is designed to further our conversations we've been having about states of mind, as well as the two gifts of speech and mind. When we recognize that all is mind, then we ask ourselves, what is filling up this mind? The mind, being a container, is filled with thoughts, interpretation specifically, based on behavioral actions or lack of emotional interpretation. And as always, to simplify it, we can reflect back on the Robert Diltz model. The idea is you have a goal, you have a vision, that which you desire to see brought forth. And your identity is also your state. It represents states, which is related to the infinite potentiality of what can be brought forth and how to be brought forth, as discussed by Neville Goddard. We are moving through states, and there's infinite states. Some states are temporary, and some are more fixed. The ones that are more fixed is what we refer to as identity. Now, when we look at the Robert Diltz model here, we reflect and realize that values and beliefs, capabilities, behaviors, and environments are an externalization of the state or the identity. The goal is to bring forth our vision, to turn our vision into environment, into the five sensory experience. And this is done primarily through our state of mind. Now, there's two fundamental ways of looking at it, and there's varying degrees between the two spectrums. We could say positive state of mind or positive mental attitude, or we could say negative state of mind or negative mental attitude. Whatever label we choose to give to the state, we want to remember that from the state, the inner dialogue, the speech, flows both in our mind, in how we interpret the five sensory experience and thus reveal the opportunities, or through our communication with others. So much when it comes to the entrepreneurial space is a integration of relationships plus resources. Some of you might know I had a conversation with Brian Scott on his channel. I'll put a link in the description. I recommend watching this. We spoke about it in there, in which we referred to the pathway of entrepreneurship as another form of mental alchemy, which means rearranging the mind, the acres of diamonds, which represents the mind, to reflect as proper identification and the connecting of the dots of the infinite resources and relationships that are available and the potentiality of those in what we would call the outer world and relate it back to our vision, thus creating opportunities and otherwise what we call leveraging the five sensory elements or working with the five sensory elements to bring forth what we desire. This is the journey. That stated, reality of the five sensory experience, the outer world, is both inspiring and revealing at the same time. We also remember that even though we call it outer world, this is still one world, as Neville Goddard refers to it, as consciousness being the only reality. So we segment it in our mind. We say inner world, outer world, and we put it back together and see it as one. The outer world can be seen as the world of effects, and the inner world seen as the world of cause. Cause can also be looked at its state of mind. Whatever state of mind you choose to identify with, it will be reflected in your five sensory integration and five sensory interpretation. Thus, the five sensory or reality, when we look at it from the outer world perspective, is both inspiring and revealing at the same time. It is inspiring us. Thus, if we look at it from the entrepreneurial perspective, we've got relationships and resources, and we can be inspired by what we experience through the five sensories to integrate and produce results, number one. Number two, it's 
both revealing about our state of mind, as well as teaching us as to what is within our subconscious mind in which we are automatically interpreting reality from that perspective. So simply put, we want to get into a state of mind that is the ideal state of mind, that which is in harmony with what we desire to create. Because when we get into state, all else flows. So Joseph Murphy says, your mental attitude the way you think, feel, and believe determines your destiny. Mental attitude. We can also look at this as a state of mind. That state of mind represents what you think, feel, and believe, which determines your destiny. Or, another way of looking at it, is your journey as well as how you bring forth that which you desire, your destiny, that which you want to bring forth in the already complete, all-existing eternal now. As stated, it may look like we are creating this experience. A good way of looking at it is realizing that creation is already complete and that we are moving down a pathway in which we wear a lens, the state of mind or the identity. And as a result of, you could say, identifying with that state, we experience certain thoughts, feelings, sensory integration that brings forth what we desire from a place of flow, love, joy, bliss, and ease, or any other type of interpretation. That is based on the state of mind. The reaction or response you get from your subconscious mind will determine by the nature of the thought or idea you hold in your mind. So the nature of our thought or our idea can be categorized as a state of mind. Now I'm going to reflect back on some experiences here. Some of you might know that for many years I had a partnership, and I still do, with Iris Reading, where I teach these workshops on productivity and so forth. For many years I would travel and teach these workshops. And one of the things that I did when I was building my IT business back in 2010 was I would teach these workshops as part of what I did, another source of income, as well as a opportunity to practice and develop my communication skills. And I was blessed with this opportunity because via this opportunity, I was able to integrate a lot of the things that I was learning. And I wanted to become quite proficient at communicating publicly. So one of the best ways to do it is to actually teach and do the thing. So. As a result of doing the thing, I would start to learn about myself and what would bring me into an ideal state of mind. What I noticed was very interesting. I would have an audience, and sometimes it would be about 100 people at a time. So it would be anywhere from 20 to 100 at a time. And prior, that whole week leading up to that event, I found myself being very reactive to certain assumptions that I have within myself or beliefs within myself about the experience of teaching that particular workshop. And what I found is that when I started to teach it, I would feel disconnected, I would feel reactive, I would feel insecure, we could say. And I realized that the audience would reflect that appropriately. It would reflect it accordingly, accurately, in their reactions. Now, as I interpreted their reactions, I also found myself dwelling in that state of mind. Now, because I've been a student of NLP for a while leading up to this and working with power of mind and power of the subconscious mind from Joseph Murphy, I realized that this was a reflection of a state of mind. So I created a little ritual that I did prior to teaching the workshop that worked really well for me to bring me into the state of mind. So when I would arrive at the venue, and these were done at hotels, downtown Toronto and wherever we do them, we do them usually in hotels. Before I would approach the conference room and enter in and see all the individuals ready to learn from what was being taught, I would randomly talk to five people in the lobby, wherever I was. Because for me, what I found is that put me in a state of mind which I would call the ideal state of mind. 
I would get into what Tony Robbins referred to as state. It would be the ideal state that would reflect as the ideal experience, realizing that that particular workshop was part of my journey, as Neville refers to the bridge of incidents, to the fulfillment of what I desire to experience, which was the definite chief aim, the business goal. Now, I knew it was. I followed my intuition and committed to doing that workshop, even if it wasn't what appears to be directly related to building an IT business. By teaching those workshops, it contributed so greatly to my ability to articulate myself and in consultative selling that I found myself closing a lot more deals. Higher quality relationships were built as a result of maintaining that state of mind, which was facilitated by my experiences from teaching that workshops. And this is what Steve Jobs refers to as connecting the dots, looking backwards. Now, that stated, I recognize that by talking to five people, and I can't say that that it will be the case for everyone, I found myself in a state of mind. There was something that I did behaviorally. And again, I had learned this from Brian Tracy when he had said this back in the days about walking a certain way and carrying yourself a certain way and observing how it reflects in the outer world experience in how others relate to you. So simply put, change your physiology, change your state, but we can look at it as change your inner conversations, change your state, further affirm what you desire to experience, which in the personal development world, we say, pick up your card, which contains your definite chief aim and read it and visualize it. And you'll find yourself in the state. And also I found this through behavioral changes for me talking to five people. So before we get into a deeper discussion in this, and I've got three ways which are built on the foundation of my experience and working with thousands of clients, helping them get into this ideal state. I want to share with you these three ways. I've summed them up into three ways. Let's talk about a little bit more about that particular experience that I had in getting myself into state. So. My goal was to talk to five people prior to the event. What I found was that as a result of that, I would release from mental chatter. I would get into the flow. I would get into state. And I knew that I was in the ideal state of mind through, and it doesn't necessarily have to be five, although I set that number in my mind because I found that usually after two or three people, I would get right into that state and after speaking with five people, boom, I was in that state of mind. So I set that number. What I would find is that maybe the first conversation well, these are just individuals anywhere in the hotel, they could be in the lobby, they could be at the reception. And I wouldn't even think about what to say to them. The goal was to just have a harmonious conversation with another human being or a group of individuals. So I can get to know about them and enjoy the conversations knowing that it has a positive effect as well, which was bringing me into state. So as a result of having these conversations, I started to notice something very interesting that would then carry itself into the presentations, into the workshops. I would find myself first talking a lot. If I go up to somebody and start talking to them, I would do a lot more of the talking. But then after the second, third, fourth, or fifth, primarily the fourth or fifth, individual or group of individuals, I would find that they would open up to me. They would welcome me. They would just start talking and keep talking. They felt a deep level of connection. I felt a deep level of connection. The level of connection I felt externalized as the level of connection that they felt. I felt the deep degree of oneness. And that's how I knew I was in state. And from that state, I found that the ideal way of communicating that workshop, the ideal way of facilitating that workshop and bringing the students towards the results and the success that they desired flowed without any mental chatter. It was a complete flow based, joyous based experience and the environment externalized to reflect the vision, which was what I wanted a harmonious relationship with the audience, as well as facilitation of the results. 
And to prove it in equation, we would send out feedback sheets. And I would test it. I would see the difference between doing this particular ritual, talking to five people, and not. And I would observe not only the way I was interacting with everyone and their responses during the training, the seminar, the workshop, but also the feedback and do a comparison. This further brought me into a deeper level of understanding and appreciation for this idea of state of mind and the importance of maintaining the state of mind, which is why I'm a huge advocate and a huge facilitator for my clients or whoever I connect with in relation to the concept of flow. Because see, I could tell you what to do. But the truth is this, you already know what you have to do to bring forth your vision. And to recognize that you already know what you have to do, all you do is bring yourself into the state of mind, and then you will realize how so. Now, this experience is not isolated to me. We've all had this. If you reflect back on your journey in your life, you realize that there were things that you did, experiences that you had, inner conversations, different rituals or routines or whatever it is that you did or thought in your own mind that brought you into an ideal state of mind. As mentioned in one of my recent videos, one of my favorite books is The Way of the Wolf by Jordan Belfort, which to me, he's one of my favorite consultative sales trainers. And I did a discussion on his book, Way of the Wolf. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested in that. One of the things that he does, I don't know if he still does this, but he talked about it in there, is he smells peppermint to bring him into state. Now, for some of this, this might not make any sense. But we have to remember, the five senses have the potentiality to bring us into state or detach us from that ideal state based on our interpretation within. So it's really the interpretation within. It's not necessarily the five sensory experience. However, we may have and we can build, it's called anchoring in NLP, associations within ourselves to the five sensory experience to bring us into state. And for me, this was one of the ones that I used, talking to five people. I would be so in state and so in flow that as soon as I walk in the room, I would observe everybody's body language change. I remember when I was in corporate, we had in the company that I work for, which is the Canadian version or the Canadian branch of this particular organization, TJX Companies. They had a CEO at the time. Her name was Carol Merowitz. And she was listed as one of the top most powerful women on the Forbes list. When I had the experiences of being in corporate and observing that when she walked into the building, and we had six floors, all of a sudden the entire vibe of the entire building changed. I started to understand more so what was going on. So she carried with herself a certain state of mind. She also had the ability and the skills and everything that was required to be a proficient CEO. And one of the things that I realized that whether she was conscious of it or not, that she had was a certain state of mind in which everybody within her awareness would respond to it and they would automatically start behaving different. It was like night and day. I've seen this as a result of conversations with many individuals who would come off as being very persuasive or very influential. Whether they know it or not, they get into a certain state of mind and they dwell in it. They maintain that state of mind. When that state of mind is maintained, it becomes the self image. It becomes more of a fixed state of mind. Although I believe that nothing is fixed as far as identity and we can change it around, it becomes a lot more fixed. It becomes a lot more of a default state. Now, as a result of whatever it is that they do, whether they're conscious of this or not, and many people are subconscious about this, then they are conscious and I'm bringing forth a higher degree of conscious awareness to you so that you can, for whatever your vision may be, maintain your ideal state of mind. As a result of maintaining that ideal state of mind, you'll notice that the outer world harmonizes to reflect that state. Ideal inner voice dialogue, I call this the true inner voice, is brought forth for accurate interpretation of the five sensory experience. 
people begin to change, environments begin to change in ways that we might not even consciously know, but it happens to reflect that state of mind. And it's important to also be a student of this. Study individuals that are very persuasive, that are what we would call excellent communicators or charismatic, very confident. Notice how people respond to them automatically in ways they wouldn't with anyone else. Now, we all have this power to achieve this. And this power is found by identifying what our ideal state is, number one. Number two, figuring out the ways to bring ourselves into that ideal state, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And number three, making a commitment to yourself that you're going to dwell in that ideal state till it becomes your identity, as referred to in the Robert Diltz model. And from there, you'll notice. You'll know what to say, when to say, how to say, what to interpret, how to interpret. The five sensory experience will be inspiring to you rather than us feeling reactive to it. It will also reveal further optimization data. If you're an entrepreneur, it will reveal the connections between the relationships and the resources to bring forth what you desire. So thus, re-emphasizing the quote, the reaction or response you get from your subconscious mind will, will be determined by the nature of the thought or idea you hold in your conscious mind. So the thought and the idea here is realizing that there is so much power found in maintaining this ideal state of mind. It is a lot more of a simplified approach than trying to change every single thought that shows up as far as interpretation to the five sensory experience. Certainly, I'm a fan of the concept as discussed in Emmett Fox's book, The Seven Day Mental Diet, in which what we do is we observe our thoughts and we change them so that we don't dwell in the negative thought. What I also work with outer world behaviors, such as talking to five people that bring me into a state of mind. Because by changing the thought around, you bring yourself into the state of mind. But if we find ourselves constantly wanting to change our thoughts around to maintain an ideal state of mind or to find ourselves in an ideal state of mind, we can benefit from focusing on the causative factor, the higher causative factor, which is the identity or the state that represents the thoughts. For example, in the Robert Diltz model, values and beliefs are underneath identity. So if you get yourself into state, then what you'll find is that you will have a lot more of the ideal thoughts. You will understand more so what is referred to as the true inner voice or not as identified with the mental chatter, fears, doubts, and indecision. You'll be able to, if you choose to, understand them and evolve past them, thus evolving your beliefs. All of these things are facilitated by maintaining the ideal state of mind. So, as he was referring to, the thought or idea you hold in your conscious mind. Upon reflection, we realize that it's easier to maintain the state and consciously commit to the state, which automatically flows many ideal thoughts and ideas in harmony with the five sensory experience. Because then we are addressing things at a higher causative factor. Even if you look at the Robert Diltz model, if a person has a vision, because they're not recognizing the facilitators in between, and we don't recognize the state, then we might find ourselves experiencing a lot more friction and conflict in the journey. But however, if we change our state of mind, then we'll notice that the ideal behaviors flow. We'll also find it easier to perform the ideal behaviors. Now I want to share another story with you because this was an interesting experience that I had about a year ago. Many of you know that I'm a huge fan of the book As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. I also listen to the audiobook version regularly, especially when I run. Now, one of the things that I do when I listen to As a Man Thinketh while I'm running, and at this time I was running on the treadmill, 
is I really aim to integrate in my mind what he is speaking about. And what he's really speaking about in there is how outer world circumstances can be tracked back to the causative factors within, as in the causes within. Now, when you're running the treadmill and you're sweating and gasping for air and really working your body, you might not want to hear about how the causative of the circumstance of the five sensory experience is related to certain thoughts that we're having within. So I decided to further work with this just to see what happens. And I had a very interesting experience. There was a certain point where when I was listening to it while I was running, I found myself in a certain state of mind. And all of a sudden, I no longer felt my body. I noticed and I observed that I was still running. And I was running quite fine, proper form and everything. But I could no longer feel my body. Now this lasted for a good 30 seconds to a minute. And I recognized something. In that particular moment, through the associations of that particular inner conversation I was having with James Allen through his audio, I found myself in an alternative state of mind, which is not always akin to the kind of state of mind that we are in when we are working out. Now, this provides an enormous amount of insight as to how powerful the state of mind can be. And if you want to go deeper into this, I recommend reading the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, where they're talking about their experiences in some of the most traumatic situations that a human being could ever go through and observing what happens in relation to those experiences when they change their state of mind. As Joseph Murphy states, healing is due to a changed mental attitude or transformation of the mind. That's what we're doing. All day long, we are going through different states of mind. And what we want to do to the best of our ability is maintain the ideal states of mind. It doesn't necessarily have to mean one state of mind, but we want to consciously be able to wear the identity, the ideal state of mind, and transform the five sensory experience so we experience more flow, joy, bliss, fun, love on the journey. This is done through the rearrangement of the mind, transformation of the mind. So these three particular attributes aren't quotes from Joseph Murphy, but we're going to further facilitate and buy quotes from Joseph Murphy. So we've got three ways here. And they are probably many ways, but these are the ones that I've worked with that work really well for me and those that I've worked with. Number one is imagination. Number two is our beliefs. And number three is acceptance. Imagination. What we see, hear, feel, taste, and smell inspires a specific state. Now I'm talking about in our imagination. If we imagine ourselves realizing what it would look like if it was true, as Neville Goddard puts it, in our imagination, by working with the five senses in our imagination, then we'll find ourselves in the state that reflects that particular scene in our imagination. So... This is not new because one of the things that we've been doing for many years and we work with athletes is we would have them imagining what it would look like in an ideal performance. As a result of imagining the ideal performance, they put themselves in the state of mind. They bring themselves into that state of mind. And as they maintain that state of mind, again, reflecting back on the Robert Dills model, they will find that they're going to be able to find more flow, as in whatever challenges that show up. They'll be able to develop more skills or capabilities. They'll also find the ideal behaviors in which they're already subconsciously competent about to reflect in the environmental or the behavioral change. As a result, facilitating the state of mind and maintaining, dwelling the state of mind, and eventually, if done for an extended period of time, will become the default state or the ideal self-image. Joseph Murphy says, Genius is a man who is in rapport with his subconscious mind. And in this regards, we're talking about the subconscious identity, subconscious state. 
We want that imaginary scene to be our subconscious state. He says he is able to tap this universal reservoir and receive answers to his problems. Thus, he does not have to work by the sweat of his brow. Now, depending on what you're doing, as a result of getting into the state, by imagining what it would look like, and you can practice this, and then find yourself in that state, you'll know when you're in that state, when Neville refers to, it is done. Or number two, you can feel it. Or number three, simply put, you feel the love. You feel the confidence. You feel the self-esteem. You realize that you can do it. You could produce the result. It's definitely a potentiality. All of these are indicators that you have found yourself in the state. Now, if you're doing this in sales and in communication, you'll find that you'll be able to know what to say, when to say, how to say it. It was always within you, except now it's facilitated by that ideal state of mind. He says, in the genius type of mind, genius type of mind, the imaginative faculty is developed to a very high degree. Now, that's a state of mind, in the genius type of mind. And what I found is built on a couple of foundations. Number one is the recognition that you already are divine perfection right now. Number two, that you have the inner genius within you, no matter what you've heard from the five sensory experience about who you are. You have it within you. And number three is to practice imagining and recognizing through the conscious use of imagination, you find yourself in that state. And when you find yourself in that state, and you experience akin to your goals and your aspirations, what I'm referring to right here, then you will have found the power of your imagination and begin to work with it more consciously. He says, all great poets and writers are gifted with a highly developed and cultivated imaginative faculty. The recognition is that we are all gifted when we realize that this is a process. This is not something that I've seen in my experience working with many on this journey, including myself, reserved for a small group of individuals. We have the power to practice this. And as a result, we further develop it. I came from a background where I was pretty creative. And then I went into corporate, groomed by several engineers, ran my IT business, and I found myself to be very structured in the way I do things, which was great because it taught me about seeing things all the way to completion, engineer-based concepts, project management, different things that came to be very useful on my journey as far as the capabilities and skills needed to cultivate. I also found that for whatever the reason may be, I did not have creative inspiration show up. So I would do certain things to stimulate the creativity, such as talking to five people. And there's many things that one can do. This is part of the journey, is identifying what is it for you that brings you into that creative state of mind. It could be certain conversations that you have with others. It could be having fun and just enjoying life. I find that many people looking for creativity, when I reflect back on what they're doing and how they're living life, I recognize that they're just not having enough fun. They're not being spontaneous. They're not doing things that their heart desires. And they're not allowing themselves to be stimulated by those experiences and express that creative potentiality that exists within them. Now, when we're referring to great poets and writers, many that I've spoken with do these kinds of things. They have the ability to get into a state of mind and express that creativity, even in the realm of consultative selling or sales. To me, that's a form of creative use of conversation, creative expression. Yes, our goal is to speak about the benefits that the client has or can experience as a result of the product or service, but we want to do it in a way that engages them. We want to be interesting. And the way to be interesting is to be interested. Now, when we look about being interested and go back to that experience that I had earlier of speaking to five people and then reflecting back and realizing that after talking to two, three, four people, people started to open up and speak more. That's because in that moment, from that state, 
they felt that I was interested in them. And I genuinely was because when we identify with mental chatter, we are more interested in what we refer to as egotism, focusing on who is right rather than what is right, perhaps trying to get approval rather than doing the thing that is spirit of harmony. And these kinds of elements that I'm speaking of, and there could be many of them, are found automatically by getting in and maintaining the ideal state of mind. So as he states, when the world said, it is impossible, it can't be done, the man with imagination said, it is done. Through your imagination, you can also penetrate the depths of reality and reveal the secrets of nature. So we can work with our imagination to bring ourselves in the ideal state of mind by imagining ourselves performing in a way that facilitates that particular end result, thus bringing us into the state. By using NLP terminology, anchoring ourselves through visualization, through the five sensory experience in our imagination, experiencing the five senses in our imagination, we find ourselves in that state, the ideal state. Another way of doing this is through beliefs. When we believe that what we're doing has a purpose, benefits ourselves and or others, it can bring us into state. One of the key concepts of the philosophy from Neville Goddard is everyone is you pushed out. You externalized as reality. So if we recognize that the world or the five sensory experience is both inspiring and revealing to us about ourselves, then we can A, identify if we're in state or not, and B, identify the beliefs and assumptions that we have about the five sensory experience and change them using subconscious mind audio, self-talk, revision, or having conversations or being in environments such as masterminds that further facilitate those beliefs that we want. Because perhaps that's how we got many of our beliefs, by being in certain environments in which we interpreted certain suggestions from a certain perspective. The power is within. We interpret reality from within. One of the things we want to do is, as we go along on our journey, identify what disempowering beliefs we have in relation to ourselves, in relation to our vision. And again, let's go back to the Robert Dills model in relation to our environment, which represents the people, the environments, the circumstance, the information, the behaviors, the capabilities. What are those beliefs that we have about ourselves that is an inaccurate assignment of the power within? Moreover, the infinite intelligence in your subconscious can impart to you wonderful kinds of knowledge of an original nature. Now, this is called building a relationship with your intuition, which happens to be automatically facilitated as a result of being in the state of mind. And what do we do? We identify beliefs and we change our beliefs. Some beliefs can be changed easily and some of them we experience to be more challenging. But what I've realized is that once you get very proficient at this, you'll be able to change your beliefs a lot easier. What we had once assumed that we had to do all these complex things to change our beliefs can bring us back into a very high level and powerful use of the two gifts of speech and mind by making a statement about ourselves or an affirmation, assuming it to be done and then finding ourselves in that state of mind and dwelling in it. And as we maintain that state of mind, the identity changes. That becomes the default state. Thus the beliefs change. Though invisible, its forces are mighty. Within your subconscious mind, you will find the solution for every problem and the cause. Thus, we're also talking about accurate interpretation of the five sensory experience in relation to our vision, which is found within. It's important to, whenever you hear any kinds of information, be it my information or anyone, recognize that it is both revealing and inspiring. You ultimately have to find within what is in harmony with your truth. And once you recognize this important statement, then you will be able to intuitively find the accurate meaning. And you will find yourself also more in harmony with the five sensory experience, bringing the outer world and inner world into one world. As Neville refers to it, we are all imagination. And the subjective mind or the sub subconscious mind, either term may be used, perceives by intuition. Now this can be a radical change of mind. Because perhaps 
we might have been so identified with the five sensory experience that we're constantly looking for answers in the five sensory experience. And while I believe it's important to also acquire what I refer to as specialized knowledge, the skills, the behaviors, and so forth, it's also important to couple that and harmonize that with the knowledge of the inner world received within and enabled by our beliefs. So thus we want to take inventory of our beliefs, what our interpretations are of the five sensory experience, as well as ourselves, and bring it more into alignment with the ideal state, thus finding ourselves automatically assigned with that ideal state. Because if you believe that something can break your flow, and that thing shows up in the outer world, and you get out of your flow, you get out of your ideal state, then that is optimization data. You can find the accurate interpretation in harmony in relation to your vision and change it, doing the subconscious work, and then bringing yourself into subconscious response to that particular five sensory experience in a way that maintains your state. And then number three, we've got acceptance. One of the things we want to recognize is that we can bring ourselves into state working with our imagination by visualizing self-talk, affirmations, and so forth, working with the two gifts of speech and mind, which is also facilitated by beliefs. But there are times when we need to just accept, just accept the circumstance for what it is, thus releasing the reactivity from it. And knowing that the reactivity, when we sense that reactivity, it can be an indicator of going into a different state. By simply being more accepting and understanding, as Stephen R. Covey puts, seek first to understand then to be understood. Realize that there's many interpretations of any five sensory experience. As we say in the Kabbalion, everything is and isn't at the same time. Now, that's also very much akin to realities both inspiring and revealing at the same time. At the same time, that's what it is, both. As a result of recognizing and accepting that things can be one way or another way, we find ourselves less reactive, thus maintaining that ideal state. So as Joseph Murphy states, we must recognize that the subconscious mind accepts all suggestions. It does not argue with you, but it fulfills your wishes. So we're talking about suggestions. We can suggest from the inner world via our imagination, via our beliefs, or we can interpret the five sensory experience and see ourselves reactive to whatever that is, and thus allowing ourselves to be suggested to go down a different interpretation of the five sensory experience, thus changing our state. When we recognize that the subconscious mind accepts all suggestions, we want to be more conscious on what we are suggesting to ourselves, assumptions, beliefs, imagination and also interpretation of the five sensory experience. Because whatever we accept to be true, that we affirm to be true, subconsciously saying it is done to it, has the potentiality to be brought forth. And this is why maintaining state sometimes can be very easy, and for some of us, it can be very challenging. And that's okay because these conversations are designed to help facilitate, more and more so through each conversation, a greater ability to identify your ideal state in relation to your vision and maintain it for longer durations, thus turning that state into more of a subconscious self-image-based identity. The subconscious mind will accept your beliefs and your convictions. This holds the key right here. The subconscious mind will accept your beliefs and your conviction. So who is assigning the meaning? We are assigning the meaning. We are assigning the meaning within. Based on our meaning within, we will find the revelation of that in the outer world. We call that proof. And as a result of knowing that this is the way it is, we can then choose consciously what we are imagining, our beliefs, and our ability to accept. Perhaps you don't know right now how things work. And you might not want to rack your brain trying to figure it out, thus identifying with mental chatter. It might be okay to just accept whatever that is for now, just for now, into higher degrees of awakening. And when we're talking about maintaining an ideal state of mind, 
We want to also have the power to question our beliefs and recognize which beliefs seem to be bringing us out of the ideal state of mind and be more fluid in our mind and change it as needed because we have the power to do this. And the subconscious mind works through auto-suggestion or self-talk or inner conversation or inner dialogue, works with our imagination, and we have the power to change all of it, thus finding ourselves in the ideal state of mind more often, dwelling in it more so, till it becomes more of our default state, otherwise known as the self-image. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.